every day I went, I was like weaker and weaker and weaker because the only thing I was doing was trying the same move over and over and over. And it was like, I wasn't doing any rock climbing. I wasn't topping anything out. And so it was like, that led to me getting physically weaker, which led to like my mentality being really dark and negative. So it was like the whole thing was like sort of a disaster. Hey y'all, I'm Ryan Devlin and welcome to the Struggle Climbing Show, where I talk with elite climbers about their struggles and breakthroughs in training, nutrition, tactics, and mental game, and also what they're passionate about beyond the fight with gravity. Today, we chalk up for a chat with Alex Johnson. AJ is one of the most badass boulderers and comp climbers out there, and she just keeps getting stronger. What the hell? She's won nationals five times and has two World Cup gold medals. She's bouldered 100 V10s and famously, as featured in the most recent Real Rock film, sent the insanely tough V14 buttermilk test piece, The Swarm. Now, what she experienced after she finally sent that life goal project will probably surprise you, and she talks all about that in today's conversation. AJ has dialed in her training to a science, and she pulls the curtain back on that in our chat, along with so much more. And beyond climbing, Alex is advancing LGBTQ plus issues as an ambassador with Athlete Ally, and has helped to develop some really cool giveback products with Evolve and Athletic Brewing. As Alex shares, she goes 100% or not at all, and that is clear in this interview. I think she may have chugged some pre-workout before we chatted, and I love it. The official climbing nutrition sponsor of The Struggle is Fizzy Vantage. You guys, I love this stuff. It was founded by legendary climbing coach and author Eric Hurst. It is the best nutrition for climbers in the world. Let me tell you about one of my favorite products, their Weapons Grade Whey Protein. Coach Hurst designed this one-of-a-kind protein complex to provide a dual-phase release of muscle-building amino acids for fast recovery and optimal strength gains. And that means you're going to get stronger after your workout and while you sleep, boom. Each serving contains 21 grams of protein, including 5 grams of BCAAs and 10 grams of essential amino acids, as well as a microdose of creatine to support power recovery. But how does it taste, Ryan? Friggin' awesome. Try their Strawberry Blast, their French Vanilla, or their Chocolate Mount Explosion. They're all good. I'm telling you, you're going to be happy. Also, as a climber, it just feels great to support a company that was founded by climbers for climbers. So definitely check them out. Hit that link in your show notes and use checkout code STRUGGLE15 to save 15% off any full-price nutrition order at fizzyvantage.com. The struggle's carbon neutral thanks to a partnership with the Honold Foundation, whose mission is to support solar energy for a more equitable world. Swing on over to honoldfoundation.org and offset your carbon footprint like I do. It's super easy, and while you're there, you can check out the amazing projects that they support, such as solar-powered education for all-girls schools in Guatemala and Liberia. How cool is that, y'all? And lastly, after my chat with AJ, stick around for a couple minutes to hear my takeaways and learn how you can score some swag from the show. All right, get ready to try hard as we crimp down on this chat with Alex Johnson. Alex Johnson, welcome to the Struggle Climbing Show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm so psyched to have you. You just came off of what is like the most insane, incredible year, 2021. You crushed. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it was not not bad and interesting to be, well, obviously, the oldest I've ever been. Um, it also the strongest I've ever been. So that's, that's cool. I love that. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited to talk to you about training, nutrition, tactics, mental game, the whole shebang. Before we jump in, though, I'd love to hear from you what struggle means to you through the lens of climbing. What's your relationship with struggle? I think uh, <clears throat> struggle and I are on very close terms. <laughs> Something that I'm incredibly familiar with. I think most most of my career, from my perspective, has been failure or around failure. And I think a lot of other people wouldn't see it that way, but but that's the way that I see it. And it, I know it's like a little dark, but... Well, well, why wouldn't other people see it that way? Like, how do you see it, uh, maybe compared to others? So I have been successful competing. Like, I've won nationals a few times. Um, I have World Cup gold medals. I've been successful outside. Like, I've climbed some of the hardest things that I've set up to try. And that's, could, that's like, positive and could be seen as a very successful career. And I think it has been. But 
there's also so much along that road and along the way that I didn't do or haven't done. So it's, I won two World Cups. I didn't win every one. I didn't win all of them, you know, and it's like I've climbed V12 and V13 outside, but not that many. And I mm-hmm. think I've compared to how many I've tried, like how many World Cups I entered versus how many I won versus how many V12s and 13s I've tried and how many I've done. The ratio is definitely like, I would say more leaning towards struggling. Yeah. And I think my career has been successful and awesome, but I've definitely like tried way more things that I've been successful at, but that's kind of neat, I think. Yeah. So that's interesting. Um, cause you're right. I think like looking at like your, your hit list of accomplishments, it's bonkers. You have had a wildly successful career and it's just getting better. And as you said, you're just getting stronger, but the backstory of that, the, the pyramid of effort that it takes to get those bullet point wins comes with a lot of struggle. And so when you deal with struggle and challenge and defeat and failure that much, a necessary part of being a professional climber, how does that relationship form then? I think it's just so common in our sport and there's so much failure. I think it's like predominantly failure and there's so much that goes on like behind the scenes or behind closed doors or like in the you get nitty gritty in the training that people don't see in a lot of like what is shown on social media is like the blip of success. And there's so much behind and, and in the back of that, that goes into that blip of success that I think struggle is something that's just like, it's day, daily. And I think my relationship to it right now, it's if you ask me like a literally any other day, like it could be a totally different answer, but I think my relationship to it right now is acceptance. Right on. All right. Well, let's just dive in, AJ. Let's um, get into some training here. Where have you struggled with your training? Um, I think for a long time, I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't know how to train and I didn't know how to train the right way. Like our sport, honestly, is still so relatively new and young. And there's so much scientific backed training that goes into so many other sports. And that's something that I think I've only recently discovered. Hmm. And a lot of that has been with the help of Tyler Nelson of Camp Forehaven Performance. And I think um, there's so much scientific backed training that goes into so many other sports like if you look at like mma or like ufc fighters like their training and their diet and their like regiment is so meticulous and it's like down to macros and calorie count and like it's just it's pinpointed down to perfection basically exactly what they need to do to succeed and it's like proven and it worked it's working it's like science science-based, science-backed. And so then we get to climbing and it's like our sport, honestly, is still so relatively new and young. Oh, you're so right. It's it's like wild to think about really how truly young the sport is. I mean, I was just talking to Lynn Hill recently and I couldn't believe I was talking to the Lynn Hill. You know, like you can just have conversations basically with the people who pioneered what modern rock climbing is. So through that lens, um, obviously, we're still learning a lot and we're bringing a lot of science to our training. What was it like before that, right? Before you started working with Tyler and you started getting a little bit more specific, what was your training like? For sure. Um, I was totally just winging it. I was like ripping weighted pull-ups. I don't even know how many or like how much weight. Like I wasn't keeping track of anything. I would just like go into the gym and be like, what? How people do weighted pull-ups. I should do some of those today and like put a load of bunch of weight, like do some weighted pull-ups and like lay on the floor and do sit-ups and it's just like this sort of like arbitrary strength training things that like apply to sports in general, but not as specific as you can get with climbing. And it was yeah. like hangboarding. Like I had no idea what I was doing for hangboarding. So I just didn't do it. Hmm. I would like do four by fours on the wall, like four by fours, rip some weighted pull-ups and then like lay on the floor and do some sit-ups or something. Yeah. I mean, this basically just sounds exactly like how I would train. You know, I would essentially go into the gym and try to destroy myself so that I could barely hold the steering wheel on the way home. So um, now com- compare that to how you train now. For sure. I think back then I thought the more tired I got, the more more benefit I would see or the more gains I would see. And so sure. I would go in and just like absolutely wreck myself. And so the thing that's trained the most for me is that in having my training become way more specific, I'm just doing significantly less hmm. and still seeing more gains. So everything is just so precise and, and specific and like exactly the amount I need to do, exactly the weight I need to do, exactly the rep sets I need to do to like see those gains and not like not a minute more. And so I'm not like crawling out of the gym. Everything I do is is with intention or not at all. 
So it's, if I'm not going to give a hundred percent into something, then there's no point in doing it. Or like if I'm slacking on my handboarding and I'm not giving a hundred percent, you're not going to see the gains. So then you just like quit. Like if you're not feeling a hundred percent, quit. And there's, there's something to be said about like powering through feeling shitty for sure. But there's also like so much important and like you try your absolute hardest every single time or what's the point? I try a hundred percent in the few really precise things that I need to do and then I'm done. That's badass. That's so yeah. badass. And it's so counterintuitive. I think for, for whatever reason, we, we climbers are gluttons for punishment. And so we always just want to be crawling out of the gym for whatever reason. And totally. so masochistic. Yeah. So was that hard for you? Like just mentally, was it hard for you to, yeah. to, to make that switch? Yeah. And I had to be told, stop. Mm -hmm. Like I'd be like, no, no, that was like, that was just a bad one. Like, I, let me try one more time. Like I can do another rep. And my trainer would be like, no, you're done. You're done. Yes. Yeah. That, this concept of like quality over quantity is really hard for a lot of us to wrap our heads around, but has just been proven to be so effective. And, and, you know, you've got some of the strongest fingers in rock climbing. The, oh. oh, no. Yeah. No, I have fast fingers. Oh, tell me. Okay. Yeah. I was like nerding out so hard on this compared to most other strong professional female climbers. My hands are on the weak side, like relatively weak. That is shocking to me. Dude, yeah. And that me, I was like, I'm strong, that's strong fingers. And then I went and I got tested and like Alex Vest has the strongest fingers strength to weight ratio like in, in the game as far as anyone who's been tested. My hands are really fast. So I think Allison's like strength to weight ratio capability was like 2.8. Her fingers can pull 2.8 times her body weight. Yeah. Mine geez. is 1.7. Wow. But I can activate that 1.7 in like two tenths of a second or something. So it's it's contact strength. Like I have really fast activation. So I can't like sitting and just being like, burr, like pulling. My fingers aren't that strong, but I can like grab a hold really fast. Which is incredibly important. Yeah. I didn't even know that there was like a breakdown like that. Like I was like, it's strong fingers or it's not strong fingers, but it, it comes down to like strong fingers at speed. So how do you train that then? Because, you know, it wouldn't just be like max weighted hangs on an edge because that's that's strength training. Right. So that's like theoretically what I need to be training is like max weighted hangs on an edge to sort of up that like strength to weight ratio number. But girls like, let's say Allison, let's just say for the sake of the example that her activation is really slow. Mm -hmm. So she can like rip 2.8, but it takes her like almost half a second to reach that. Th this is still right. theoretical. Theory. Right, right, right. Um, the way that she would train that to get faster is, is called like RFD pulls or like campusing is a great way to do it because you're like throwing a latching. You're just basically taking the strength that you've gained and, and trying to train it to be faster. So an RFD pull, that's rate of force development. The way that I've trained this is like stand under a campus board and like reach up to a campus rung and just like as fast as you can, like rip as hard as you can for three seconds and then let go. Or like jumping up and catching holds. Like you're just training like grab faster. So yeah. off, just off the ground, like jump, grab, jump, grab, jump, grab. I love this. This is great. <laughs> it's, it's such good nerdy stuff because what's being strong if you're not fast? Totally. You know, I mean, it's it, like the two have to go together. And, and, and also, I imagine now that you've discovered that one of your superpowers is that you're fast one of your areas of improvement is that you could be stronger. There's something almost empowering in that knowledge. You know what to train now. Easy. It's easy to get stronger. Yeah. Hang on and work. Load up the weight. <laughs> Let's do this easy. It's easy to get strong. It's hard to get good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, technique we'll get to in, in just a minute. But before we um, move on from this training section, I'm curious to understand how you look at rest and sleep. Mm. I, I would say without like throwing myself under the bus, I would say that I probably rest more than anyone else I know. Mm. I know Nathaniel Coleman rests a lot and is like really meticulous about his rest and his sleep as well. Um, I take a lot of, I take a lot of days off. And I think knowing how precise and specific my training is and knowing that I can go into the gym or into the garage and do exactly what I need to do to get stronger. Also knowing the rest and the time it takes to rebuild that, I think has been something that I've learned just with age and experience. Like there's seven days in the week I train four or climb four. So it's like sometimes I take one day off, sometimes I take two days off. Sometimes I'll take three days off. If I if I had like a gnarly day, I'll take two or three days off. And then I come back and I feel as good or better. Like I I mm. rest a lot. 
Yeah, that seems rare for for rock climbers. Is that something that you've developed over time because you've just felt your body or have you always valued rest? I think just experience and knowing how much that you like can or do break your body down. It's so like training, right. training, 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 training. You're, you're never getting stronger. You're like essentially just getting, you're getting weaker or you're going to get hurt. So two or three days off. Sometimes I take four days off before like a big comp and then I'll like warm up the day before. And then like, I feel like I can lift a bus. Okay, Alex, let's talk about nutrition now and uh, any areas there where you've struggled. I would say that throughout my entire life, nutrition as a whole has been a struggle for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> damn, dude, I grew up in the Midwest on like the fast food diet. It's like there's not where and when I grew up, there like has not been a lot of education around nutrient dense foods and how much it does have an effect on your body. Like it's you're marketed to as a kid and as a high schooler to like want fast food. And I was like running track in high school and college and like eating McDonald's for breakfast and Taco Bell for dinner. So it was like <laughs> half my life was spent like eating fast food and like trying to be an athlete at the same time. And even in 2012, 13, 14, when I moved out west and for the second time and was like, I'm leaving the gym in this. I have like Arby's or Burger King. And I'm like, what has more protein, like a fish filet sandwich or like a cheeseburger? You know, it was like, I'm so ignorant. <laughs> you know, uneducated when it came to nutrition that <laughs> I just was like googling the protein in a fish filet sandwich from freaking Arby's or whatever and it's like this is good this fish sandwich has more protein and then it's like there's no fish in that there's no fish in that this is it's so great it's like and they probably sell protein shakes at the gym but you were walking straight past them totally. going to Arby's yeah oh, like, dude that fish filet sandwich has got to be packed with nutrients it's cod you know cod liver oil and there's no finish in those. So oh, geez, it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. So then, you, you know, at some point in time, you woke up to nutrient-dense foods. Um, so so what do you focus on now? Totally. Um, for me, it's like sustainability. And for my body, not environmentally. Like sustainability is in like, I want to train. I want to get the most out of my tree. I want to get the most out of my sessions. And in order to do that, I need a certain amount of calories. And so for me, like a cut before an event or before a trip, like... I'll do, but it's more important for me to have the energy and calorie amount to train and keep training and train train smarter and harder and longer than it is to like what lose three pounds to like try to hang up smaller crimps or something. Like I I think I've always been an athlete who has been like I'd rather get stronger than lighter. And it's easier for me to get stronger than it is to get lighter. So getting the right amount of protein and for me that's like as many grams as pounds that I weigh. So it's a lot of like, I do um, pro like personalized protein shakes from Gainful, my nutrition partner, and I'm doing like packets of tuna, which sounds like really gnarly, but there's like these really delicious flavored like tuna packs. And it's like the perfect Craig, Craig snack. Like it doesn't need to be cold or hot. It's just like you rip it open and you eat it with a fork. So that's great. And then a lot of yeah. like chicken, like tons of chicken breasts, like I'm um, meal prepping and crock potting. And, and a lot of that is usually on like a bed of spinach or kale. Like it's t lots and lots of vegetables. I have a nutritionist part-time, like we meet up either a couple times a year or like throughout the year. And she helps a lot with understanding the things that you need in order to help digest protein. So that would be carbs. And it's like, you can't just only eat protein because the first thing you burn when you're working out is carbs. It's carbs, mm -hmm. fat, and then protein. So you're burning carbs. And so you want to like fill up essentially with like really healthy, like simple for like fast release and complex carbs. So it's like white rice, vegetables, stuff like that. And so carbs and then fat and then protein. Even after a workout, like you, you can't just like keep pounding and pounding protein. Like you need carbs to help you break down and digest protein. There's like whole science to it that I, I don't know that well, but I'm trying <laughs> Do it best I can here, but I'm pretty well, you're, sure. Yeah, you're, you're, you're working with somebody who does. And so that person totally. then is the nutritionist is helping you to plan some meals. Um, and I, I haven't seen the Arby's menu. I don't believe chicken breast on rice and spinach <laughs> is on the menu. So so you're cooking Sadly more, it sounds enough. like as well. Yeah. Um, what about alcohol consumption? I've seen you post about that. And it, it looked like when you were training for the Olympics, like you stopped consuming alcohol kind of full stop. How, how did that play into your nutrition? And, and where are you now with it? So I would go to the gym and have these like amazing sessions and like totally bust ass and work really hard and see a bunch of gains and then go out with friends for the night and like get a little drunk 
and then the next day just feel like garbage and like not be able to train, not really be able to climb, go in and just be like, man, I like busted ass yesterday and I just feel so terrible. And it was like, well, obviously it's because I drank last night. And so it was like that for me was just such a like, oh, duh moment. And so when I decided to try to qualify for the Olympics, it was the first and easiest thing to change about my lifestyle was not drinking. And it was like, okay, done, easy. Like I don't need that. If it makes me feel like I felt bad for like four to five days after, it wasn't just like you get a hangover for the next day, right? Everyone happens to everyone. But for me, it wasn't even like the next day hangover. It was just like the next few days of not feeling like I could push myself or work as hard as I wanted to. And then therefore didn't think that I would be able to see the gains that I wanted to see in the time that I had to train. And so. Interesting. Yeah. So, so was the effect uh, immediate, like when you cut alcohol out from your diet, what, what was the impact on your performance? Yeah, I think within two weeks of stopping drinking, it's not like I was like drinking that much, you know, it was like once or twice a week going out and having a couple drinks with a couple friends. And then even that, like, it's so weird and it sounds really like cliche, but it's like my, my like body composition changed too. Like I like started to like tone up more and yeah, it was pretty dramatic differences pretty quickly. Yeah, I've got a great relationship with my beer belly and <laughs> you know, especially on those slab top outs where I'm just kind of like beach whaling it up over the, over the lip. <laughs> yeah, I still do that. All right, let's talk about tactics here for a minute. And I would love to zero in on the swarm. Um, First of all, congratulations. You got it. Thank you. I did. So sick. What a fight. Oh, yeah. So I mean, the Swarm is just like the most kind of formidable, stunning pieces of rock that you could ever see. I mean, sitting out there in the buttermilks with this incredible backdrop behind it, it looks almost blank. And obviously, this was like the mega proj for you. And I really appreciated how open you were throughout the entire process of like identifying it and working it and you know, giving up on it for, for a little while. Tactically speaking, what was it? What was the big struggle here with the swarm? Aside from pinging a V14 boulder, which is just madness. Um, like the projecting process and sort of how one dimensional I was approaching it and how like pigeonholed I was and like trying this one boulder over and over again. And it's like the hardest move on the boulder is the second move. You pull off the start, grab this first, like the smallest worst sharpest most horrible thing you could ever grab then you like jump to this other cramp and so that's that's the hardest part look look jump and it's, this is so sharp that you only get four to six tries a day and this is so hard that it takes significantly more than four to six tries in a day to like sort of learn and you were living out at bishop at this time right i was living in my trailer in the grocery store parking lot and i think i was there for like three months or something and you were only focused on the swarm at this time i mean yeah. you were just going out there every day every Every day that I could. And so I would go up and throw myself with this this one move for as many tries as I could possibly get in a day, which is really only four to six before you'd split a tip or start bleeding. Or there's It wasn't usually strength wow. or fitness that would end the day. It was skin. Wow. So for such like minimal, it was like minimal attempts, minimal time climbing, maximal skin loss led to like not that much rock climbing and like a shitload of resting to grow back skin. And so it's like, you're trying the same one move maybe half a dozen times in a day and then you're done. And then you take two days off to regrow skin. And then you go up and you try and save one move a couple times, rip a flapper, take two days. It's just like, there was, wow. I regressed like physically. And so I was just getting, every day I went, I was like weaker and weaker and weaker because the only thing I was doing was trying the same move over and over and over. And it was like, I wasn't doing any rock climbing. I wasn't topping anything out. And so it was like, that led to me getting physically weaker, which led to like my mentality being really dark and negative. So it was like the whole thing was like sort of a disaster. Yeah, that's a really interesting way of looking at it. And, and I think maybe for those of us who do get obsessed with projects like I have in the past, I think a lot of people do, you know, you find your proj and then you're just dreaming about it and running through the beta in your mind. And so you get that good weather window and you head straight back on it and maybe not thinking that that specificity, especially if it's like a limit move right off the ground, like you were doing, might actually cause you to regress, right? Or, or... deteriorate, <laughs> like physically and emotionally, I was deteriorating. <laughs> well, so then tactically, what changed? Because you really threw yourself at that for months, years. I mean, it was just this, this mega long project that you walked away from. Then you came back 
And what was different? Because the, the boulder didn't change. For sure. Um, my whole approach was different. And I think that year that I spent three months living out there, when I first got there, I was I felt really strong on it and really close and had stepped the second move a couple of times and was like falling off in the middle. And then just again, was like deteriorating after that from lack of climbing, like physically and mentally. It was just like really a mess. And so going back, I was like training and training and training. And tra- like it was, it's always been in the back of my mind, training, training, climbing hard things around here. Like I did this like super creepy, sick V11 that was super, like really cool. And then I climbed V12 in Utah, which I hadn't done since like 2015. And so it'd been like almost five years since I'd climbed V12. And that sort of was like, huh, I just did the hardest thing I've done in five years. And it was creepy. I wonder if I'm like getting, maybe I'm getting back to work. It's like all these things started going on in my head. And I'm still just like training, training, thinking like, maybe, maybe this is the year. Maybe I'll go back. I don't know. But like not ever voicing this because it's fucking scary because I like publicly failed. Like in my mind, I was like, I'll never be strong enough. I'll never be strong enough. Like this boulder broke me in so many different ways. I'll never be strong enough. And then at one point, Brie was finally like, we're fu- just, we're going to, let's fucking go. You'll never know until you go. And I, I'm just like, no, I'm not ready. I need to be stronger. I'm not ready. She was like, maybe you're not, but we'll go and we'll see. Like, you'll find out. And my first day on it was amazing. And I like felt like I was like, oh my God, I almost did it. Like I like almost set the second move and then did the shoulder move, which I've never done before. And then took it to the top. And I was like, holy shit. That's so awesome. So, so then you did hop right on it, but didn't just focus on that the entire time you were there. It was probably every other or every third climbing day we would go up there. It was not every day. So we would go to like the Buttermilk's main zone and just climb V8 or V9 or V6, like pull and top things out and remember what it feels like to like be successful and like get that confidence or we'd go like, and then I'd go to the swarm and try it for one day and then take a day off. And then I'd like go climb the happies and like, just be like, oh, cool. I did a V10. Like I'm, I'm, okay, I'm still fit. Great. And it was just the whole approach was different and filled with so many other things. Like obviously the point of the trip was the to project this boulder, but it was padded i guess by like other goals like smaller but like still significant goals and just like a different tactic and i think that's ultimately what led to like being successful so do you think that was more mental or physical like bringing in that variety like physically speaking you're you're climbing more things you're doing different moves you're you're using muscles mentally you're you know you're you're getting to the top you're not just on the project you know which was it for you books and maybe split right down the middle in 50 50 i think the mental part of it was even if i'm trying v6 like i still have to try hard on v6 and so it's like engaging and engaging that the try hard and the effort and i think that that's a feeling that you have to like remember Mm -hmm. and it's like that day that i think i was trying as hard as i could maybe but was i really maybe not. And so it's going and climbing all these other things and like trying hard and then topping them out. Like you get, you're like, oh, right. Like that's what it feels like to like fight for something and try hard. And then it's like, you remember that in your head. And then like, how would go up and act like be like, Rawr! and like actually try hard. I don't know if that this is making sense. No, it really is. You know, you climbed the hardest grade you've ever climbed by in essence, climbing easier things. I mean, at least intentionally taking breaks from the project and climbing things that were easier so that you could work the muscles and you could work the mental game. And I think that's awesome because I think even for us weekend warriors, there is a lot of pressure or at least a lot of emphasis that we put on ourselves for pushing that top end, going from V4 to V5 or, you know, 13A to 13B. And that's where we can get sucked into spending so much of our time. But you don't. I mean, at least historically, this past year, you you ticked off your 100th V10. I mean, that's insane. It's incredibly impressive. It's not your highest grade, but that is a lot of freaking V10s. And so it does seem like you put some more intentionality to uh, rounding out your grades rather than just pushing the top end, which I do think is a little bit novel. For sure. I think I sort of think that that's like always been my approach to climbing. And I think it started with growing up in like northern Wisconsin and not really having access to like really good outdoor climbing. It was trips for me. And and on trips, I didn't want to like spend all of my time on one thing to maybe be successful in it, even if it was like would have been the hardest thing I've ever done. I wanted because I had such a limited time in these areas, I wanted to climb everything. And I think that sort of like set this set me up for like how I have had my like professional career in climbing is like I would go on this month long trip. Maybe the hardest thing I climbed the whole month was like V10, maybe V11, 
but I would do 60 boulder problems or something, you know, like there's amazing V3s, there's amazing V1s, there's amazing, like amazing V7s. I think V7 is like the coolest grade ever. And I got to do like the best of the best that these areas had to offer and so much. And that to me felt like such a successful trip as opposed to going and sitting under the same like V12 every single day and then not getting to see anything else that the area has to offer. Yeah, this is just so great. You know, and, and not really a perspective that you often hear because there's so much emphasis on pushing that top grade. And, you know, wh whatever that even means, by the way, grades like, you know, obviously certain climbs are going to be harder or easier for you, even if they're given the same grade. But there just seems to be a lot of social credibility and maybe professional credibility when it comes to sponsors and coverage for pushing that top end. So what is the other side of that? You know, did, did it hold you back at all taking that strategy? I think maybe it, it has held me back a little bit or it did hold me back a bit in the beginning of like my career climbing outside because other women and other girls were out like sending really hard stuff that they, they projected. And I was out like sending like pretty hard stuff, but just everything. And I think yeah. I don't regret that at all or the way the way that I like approach climbing. And, and I think that it's allowed me to have like appreciation and respect and longevity in the sport. And I think it's like little goals like that that keep you like, I can't go out and sit under the same, you know, it's just like the swarm. Like I went and sat under the same hard thing for three months and it was like terrible. Like I, I want to climb everything. All right, AJ, let's talk about mental game here and let's stay on the theme of the swarm for a little bit. And uh, I'm curious what stands out to you as your biggest struggle, you know, with mindset with regard to, to that project. I think failing publicly mm -hmm. felt really embarrassing. <laughs> and you were really public with this one, right? Uh, what was the motivation uh, of that? Oh God, I sure was. I don't know, man. I think, I think... That first year that I was public about it, I truly thought I would do it that season. And that's how close I was on it. And I think because I truly thought I would do it at the end of it, I wanted to showcase or bring everyone along on the journey of projecting. You know, I'm really glad you did. I, I think a lot of people are, even though maybe it wasn't the experience that you had thought it would be when you set out to it. Sometimes those, you know, that's what, what brings upon the biggest growth in, in all of us, not just as climbers, but as humans. So what, what happens then mentally after that first season when it doesn't go? Um, I think it was like a huge ego check for me. I was so sure in the beginning of the season that I would do it. And I think that's why I like decided, I was like very confident that I would do it. It's like, yeah, whatever. Maybe it'll take a couple of days, but I'm going to do it. And then I was like, wow, I didn't. Holy shit. Okay. Maybe I'm not as good as I thought I was. I don't know. And I love feeling like super defeated and not really knowing like what to do or, or what just yeah defeated and I think my relationship with climbing was a little different and I was like kind of mad at it and that's sort of how like how and when and where the 100 v 10 goal came from is I just was like not that stoked and it was like there that started the, the 100 v 10 goal or the like try to do 100 v points in a day thing or while I was living in Vegas so it was like we would do like like poker and card related goals too where it was like do a full house or do a royal flush or like all of these like card game related goals and that was that made climbing fun again when i was pretty emotionally like beat down man i just really love that thank you for sharing that because i, I think on the mental side you know it can get kind of dark um for us especially when we're pegging our self-worth in in a sense to a very specific outcome and so uh, on the swarm you know mentally what was the shift that you went through before you went back? Obviously, physically, you were in a different space. But mentally, when you went back out there, did you feel the pressure still to send for Instagram or the sponsors or, or had you reframed it? So after that first season that I was really public and did not do it, there were a couple other times that I'd gone back in between and was like public about going back again, not, for, not ever for as long and not ever as fit. But I, I did go back in between and was sort of public about that. And then this past year when I went back, um, I didn't tell anybody. <laughs> I'm sure that like played a part and like actually being able to do it too. It was like nobody knew we were there. Like fucking no one. It was just like this big secret. I was like really anxious and stressed and nervous and afraid and intimidated and like all of these like feelings and emotions, but like wasn't feeling 
external pressure because it's a fucking secret. Yeah, there's just something to that, like simplifying. And I think we've seen that with Daniel Woods when he went into like that guru state before sending Return to the Sleepwalker or um, Alex Honnold, as he as he shared recently on the show, um, when he was really focusing on soloing El Cap, he like turned off all social media and just really got focused. And so I think there is something to be said for that. It just maybe relieved the pressure enough so that you could get the send. And what an incredible uh, accomplishment it was. So let's talk about that now, because um, oddly, it seems like there was some struggle in the send itself for you, like after you topped out that boulder. Well, weird. It was weird. Topping it was weird. And I don't know, that doesn't sound like what people probably like expected to hear, but it was, I don't know, maybe like bittersweet or just fulfilling for sure, but also still a little, like a little empty or like I had been emptied, if that makes sense. And it was, I think the same, in the same week, that I did the swarm, Daniel did return to the sleepwalker and John Glassberg did the nest. And so all three of us had sort of completed these things, this like these grand things that like our whole lives like sort of accumulated to like this, these one, one goal or one moment, all three of us kind of like did it at the same time. Like there was something in the air for sure. And then Daniel was like, sick. Yeah. So fit. Whoa. On to the next. And, and we were like in a group chat, like me, Daniel and, and Glassberg. And it was like, Glensburg and I were like, wow, that's great. Daniel, like, go get a man. Huh, I don't feel that way. <laughs> I've spent like a third of my life, like, sort of moving towards this, this one thing, this one event. And now that that event has like completed, like, wow, do you feel fucking empty? It was weird. And Glensburg had the same feeling. And it was really nice to have someone to relate to. And then he, he like reminded me that when Sharma did realization in the early 2000s, like, there's this quote that Chris was like, yeah, man, maybe I'll never climb again. And it was like, that's how I was feeling. And I think that's how John was feeling. And all of us were like, dude, what? I don't know. I just, that was it. That was, that was it. Maybe I'll never climb again. Wow. And I've had um, similar conversations with Brooke Rabatou since the Olympics. And we just like started chatting about it one day. And she was like, you're the only one who's like been able to relate to what I'm feeling. And I was like, I, yeah. And it's, it's not even that she was like, disappointed or she felt like her olympic debut was a failure it was just that it was over and it was this thing that she'd spent like years of her life building up to and whether or not you're successful or not it's over yeah and it's like the and then if it's like then what <laughs> yeah i just find this really fascinating you know I, I think it's almost like there's you just represented kind of the two ways somebody can go after they accomplish this huge goal and and one is to just stay stoked and and ride the wave and on the other side it's this experience that you had you know dog catches car totally <laughs> what, what do you do now and what was that like for you you sent you packed up what happened um i stopped climbing wow Totally. But like pretty much completely. I just was like, did, did, couldn't even muster the give a shit to like do, I couldn't, we're not even do a single pull up. I just was like, nope, not interested. Not interested. Um, yeah, I sat, I was like sitting around a lot, like ordering a lot of Uber Eats. Like I, I took like celebratory to the next level. It's like, stop climbing. Probably didn't climb for at least a month and then. Even after that, it was just obviously the strongest I've ever been. If I just did the hardest thing I've ever done, I spent years trying. Why don't I want to keep, why don't I want to keep going? Why don't I want to do more? Why, why am I not? What's wrong with me? It was like, go to the gym. No, I just fucking don't want to at all. I've talked to other athletes in this, in this position. And it's the only advice that I can give that I was like, kept trying to give myself was like, write it out. It'll come back. And the, the harder I tried to force it to come back when I wasn't ready, the more it just prolonged wanting to come back when I was ready. Man, that's such great advice. This, this interview is so good. I can't handle it. Dude, if you don't want to go, fucking don't go. It's like, I don't know. It's, it's like, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so then, and then that's what happened. Like the stoke came back at some point. Yeah. I just needed time away and time. And it's so weird because I was successful and it's that's the part that I was like what the fuck I should be so stoked like I should be wanting to go rampage like send a bunch of other shit I just cannot muster like it 
any ounce of like wanting to at all. I got really frustrated with myself. And then when the time came, I was like, oh yeah, it's on. Like I literally woke up, it was a Wednesday and I like opened my eyes and sat up in bed and was like, it's back. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> this like literally woke up and it was like, oh, fuck yeah. And then I was like, oh, kind of fat. Oh boy. Oh, okay. I'm just gonna start working out now. <laughs> All right, Alex, let's zoom out now and let's talk about things that you're passionate about beyond the fight with gravity. And specifically, I'd like to hear about your advocacy work with the LGBTQ plus community and where that started and where it is now. Totally. Um, I think, I don't know, it sort of like fell in my lap. <laughs> it was never something that I was like planning or intending on doing. And I think, I think a big thing for me, like growing up in the Midwest without the existence of social media was like not really seeing anyone who I could relate to. And that like definitely led to like the the fear of like coming out publicly. It was like what changed was just sort of the realization that like no one else is going to do it for me. So I have to do it for myself. And if if I was feeling this way, like as a kid growing up without like access or knowledge of like people who were like me, then like maybe there's other people that feel that way too. And, I, and I'm doing them a disservice. I guess by sitting in the closet. It's so weird. Like, I feel like coming out shouldn't shouldn't be a thing. Like, it, I don't even like the phrase. Yeah, you know, it, it doesn't seem fair. It's like, I, I didn't have to come out as straight. I didn't sit my parents down and say, I like girls, you know? I mean, it's, it's kind of this interesting, um, I'm sure, pressure-filled, uncomfortable double standard that you have to contend with. For so many people, it's this, like, daunting horrifying potential conversation and it's like so many kids are like kicked out of their house or like disowned by their parents like there's there's this fear around this conversation because there are so many negative reactions to it or there have been in the past and it's like so sad and horrible that it's like there has to be a conversation about it when it's just like another orientation just like straight yeah i yeah the whole thing the coming out thing like i fucking hate <laughs> it's like yeah i mean it's so wild it is what it is like i mean like my favorite color is black okay yeah she oh she came, she came so, out and she likes black oh my god <laughs> she likes purple <laughs> and when, when you did come out publicly at least um it was at a point in your life in your career where you were a celebrity like an elite rock climber so what was that like and and was the community welcoming I can only speak from my experience and that's like, I'm still like a cis white female, right. you know, like it's, I'm still privileged and coming from a place of privilege just based on like how I look and how I present. And I think my experience coming out in the climbing community was wildly and like wholly positive, but there's like things that I've seen and heard from other people and other communities and other like races and back backgrounds and upbringings that they have not had those experiences. And so that's like hard to hear, but also like sort of like the culture of the country right. right now. And it's, well, even though my experience has been like personally fine, totally fine. Like there's, I think a lot of people, most people it hasn't been, or it's not. And I think there's always work to do. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing that, Alex. And um, let's talk about that work, right? There is work to be done. And I'd love to hear from you who you've been partnering up with and who you feel uh, is doing some really good work out there to support and advance LGBTQ issues. So Athlete Ally is someone that I joined forces with sort of like right after coming out. And they're not specific to climbing. They're, they're specific to sports. And it's this really awesome nonprofit that like battles homophobia and transphobia in sports and they have like Megan Rapino is one of their athlete ambassadors so I've heard of her <laughs> technically we're all the same <laughs> ambassador team which is great <laughs> um they're awesome and they're they're badass and they're like really doing the work and it's it goes as far as like the NFL you know it's like they they like do stuff with me and climbing and it's like Rapino and like the NFL so it's they're really broad and it's really cool having that connection and having them as a resource like I learned a lot from them and I learned about like events and and other organizations and other athletes from them and so that's been really awesome and then um in the last year I partnered with Athletic Brewing to design a pride like a beer for pride and we donated profits to Athlete Ally and that was awesome and then 
Similarly, in partnering with Evolve and Rise, we designed a, a shoe like for Pride and profits went to three really awesome organizations, Inclusive Outdoors, the Black Trains Travel Fund, and the Venture Out Project. And two of the three are like partially in climbing, um, but mostly just like in getting people outside and hiking and like traveling and doing badass stuff. And then the Black Trans Travel Fund is just like what it sounds like. Like it's getting Black trans people somewhere safe, home, like wherever. And it's, I think that that work is super important. And so there's so many groups out there doing awesome things. And that was sort of the whole point of like partnering with Athletic and Evolve and Rise. It was like, I can't donate as much as I want to. So let's create this vessel in a product and sell it as a way to donate an amount that makes a difference. Yeah, I love that. You know, I think there is a huge opportunity and honestly a need for businesses to partner with nonprofit organizations to just multiply the impact out there. I mean, I started a company called This Saves Lives, which is a food company. We make really good energy bars and and snack foods. And anyway, for everyone sold, we give life-saving food to a child in need around the world through partnerships with nonprofit organizations. So I've seen firsthand how well that can work. And the projects that you're working on here, similarly, can have that impact, can support amazing organizations, but also can provide some really rad products. So what was that like for you, um, working with these these cool companies to develop these products? Yeah, it was so awesome. And it, it honestly, like a lot of the work was like already in existence. So it was like, we we basically took a shoe that Evolve already had, like their Rebel, their approach shoe. We just like picked the colors and it was like, what we wanted with the shoe was to have something that you could like show your pride or like represent your community in subtle ways. But we also understand that like not everyone feels safe or comfortable doing that. And so, and the the color on it was really minimal. And it's basically like the pull tab and like there's like a little flag on the tag. And it was like, this is a really cool, like subtle shoe where you can feel safe and comfortable wearing it out. That's just awesome. You know, I just love supporting companies that are doing better, right? Because they don't have to. They could just stay in their lane and make awesome products and sell them. But the companies who are really elevated, the ones that that go above and beyond, those are the ones that we should get behind and support. And so, you know, in your case with Evolve and Athletic, two companies that make awesome stuff, but also are doing really cool things for the community. It's just rad. And they got my support. And uh, hopefully everybody who's listening is taking note as well. Alex, thank you so much for your time today, for sharing your struggles and your breakthroughs and just your overall stoke. It's really infectious. And I cannot wait to see where you go from here. I would love to have you back on the show. Let's do it again. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having me. This was awesome. That wraps up our chat with the amazing Alex Johnson. I love this conversation. What did you all think? Let us know. You can find us on Instagram at alexjohnson89, at Ryan Devlin Outside, and at The Struggle Climbing Show. Now, I got so much out of this interview, y'all. AJ's perspective on going 100% or not at all and using science to guide her training is just definitely the future of the sport. And it's something that even us weekend warriors can focus on. Her trainer, Tyler Nelson, is going to be joining us as an expert in our analysis episodes later this season. I'm psyched about that. So we're going to dive into all of this in more detail, no doubt. Also, AJ's experience on the swarm is packed full of useful beta. Her process of focusing on topping out easier climbs to keep fit both physically and mentally while trying the Limit Project is just fantastic advice to follow. And then allowing ourselves some grace after we send the big thing is really nice to keep in mind. Just a lot of emotions that can happen there. Lastly, I'm just loving Alex's work with Athlete Ally to make climbing and the world more inclusive for the LGBTQ community. So check out their work. Shout out to Fizzy Vantage for being the official climbing nutrition sponsor of The Struggle. Try out their weapons grade way to get stronger while you sleep. You're going to love the taste of it, and it just works. While you're at the website, check out their other list of innovative nutrition designed specifically to help us train and climb harder. Hit that link in your show notes or use code STRUGGLE15 at checkout for 15% off at fizzyvantage.com. 
All right, that clips the anchors on this episode. Now, before we go, if you'd like to support the show and the climbers who make it, and I really hope that you do, I would be so grateful for you to swing by patreon.com slash the struggle climbing show. Become a patron and you'll score yourself a super cool limited edition can koozie slash travel mug, just like AJ and all the guests of the show have. Keep your caffeine hot on the way to the crag and your suds cold after the send. And most importantly, you'll be helping out all of us who make this show so that we can keep making shows just like this. Now, if you can't support as a patron, it's all good. Let me hook you up with a free sticker. Simply rate and review the show in Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Post that review on Insta and tag at The Struggle Climbing Show, and we'll send you a super rad sticker free of charge. Slap it on your Nalgene, your stick clip, your van, or your forehead so that everyone knows that you love the struggle and the struggle loves you. All right, let's climb hard and do good things in the world.